second album Twelve precious melodies Worth listening Hope you enjoy them Like if it's sun Hello and welcome to another episode of Old Men Yell at Cloud Hello! Hey! We are your hosts, Patrick S. Barry Jim Schultz Christopher Brown Yeah here we are, uh, talking today about the Stone Temple Pilots album, Purple, released on Atlantic Records on June 7th, 1994, produced by Brendan O'Brien. That was a week to the day before my 12th birthday, for anyone playing along at home. <laughs> nice. Yeah. So, so I'm, I'm, looking, I'm looking at the Wikipedia page here, and I guess there were technically five singles off of this album. Can, can you guys name all five of them? Well, like obviously Vaseline, Interstate Love Song, Big Empty. Then uh, Unglued and uh, Pretty Penny. Pretty Penny. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's all five of them. Five? That's yeah. Has five. Huh. Back when uh, people released singles off yeah. of albums. And there was a radio that played them, and people yeah. would listen to said radio to hear their favorite song. Yeah. Man. Old men indeed. <laughs> <laughs> the times they have a changed. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, so this was, uh, Purple was probably one of the first CDs I, I ever owned uh, way back when I was in sixth grade. I got uh, Purple and Core for Christmas. Uh, I had already been familiar with Tidy Music, but uh, I got those two records uh, for Christmas that year and listened to Core first and, and really enjoyed it and then uh, got into Purple afterwards and was like, wow, this is uh, way cooler. <laughs> Now we, now we were talking uh, while well, we were listening to the album about how this album was, uh, this and Core were both produced by uh, Brendan O'Brien. Yeah. And there's such a difference in the, the production of it. Yeah, it makes me wonder, I mean, uh, he's obviously a mix engineer because I think he mixed this album. I don't know if he mixed Core as well, but it just makes me wonder like what level of engineer he is. Um, or whether he's more of like a musician's producer that sits there and just says like good enough take let's add this as opposed to someone who's sitting there at the console being like what this needs is a dollop of Daisy a dollop of Daisy yeah and it needs it needs just a little bit of uh, that feedback eliminator or whatever random rack unit is sitting there that he wants to use that sort of thing yeah for sure uh, yeah definitely a big uh, you know definitely a market difference between uh between core, which is kind of more of like slick and, and LA rock, uh, and, and this record, purple feels a little more grungy and and, and au natural. Well, I would I would be careful with your wording there because it doesn't sound grunge per se. Like it's it's not a grunge album. I, I wouldn't put it on the same plateau as uh, like Nevermind or something like that. It's definitely well, yeah. like a much looser vibe, much more relaxed album. I would say than right than uh, than grunge. I think it was sort of marketed as like grunge light or, or like fringe yeah. grunge pop, if you will. Yeah, I mean, if you were to kind of just encapsulate all of Stone Temple Pilots and throw it in a category, would it be grunge? It's really more like alternative rock, yeah. I would say. Yeah. Alternative pop rock, you know. They, they, they had a lot of pop influence. You know, they, they, weren't, uh, they weren't like your other, you know, grunge bands that were more influenced by you know 80s uh post-punk and, and such it was more uh, right you know the beatles uh you know e everywhere from like beatles to kiss <laughs> really these guys you know were uh, definitely got the impression that they're big music nerds yeah and you, you didn't really get that with core with core it was just kind of like this big monolithic like rock with a capital r thing oh for sure yeah and drenched in reverb and like you just got the the feeling that they all had stds and that they were all like <laughs> sweaty at all times and that sort of thing and uh whereas this it actually sounds like they're musicians and they're real people and they're making cool music i don't know yeah so it's it's always very genuine if nothing else you know, sound, you know, you can really hear the, the passion that they put into you know, writing the songs and, and making them, uh, you know, catchy. So, what's your favorite then? All right, yes. Uh, my, uh, I wrote this down as a possible fave because I think I have two. Uh, 
Loungefly is is a favorite of mine. Uh, really, just that that kick ass opening drum fill. Really, mm-hmm. and, and you know, that coupled with, with the guitars coming in, uh, really just really takes me somewhere. Takes me back to being a youngster listening to this this record with you know with my with my headphones. Uh, yeah, you know that's funny because uh, when I was a kid, that was my favorite. Yeah, and it's it's really funny as an adult listening to it and realizing like, oh, this is a song about like treating your girlfriend like shit because you're an alcoholic. And like, yeah. as a kid, like I obviously didn't identify with that, but like I don't know, it was a song that stuck out to me the most. Yeah, I, I wrote points deducted for dumb lyrics <laughs> on this. Yeah, I mean, I, I I wrote down. I feel like the the lyrics in the verse, uh, just kind of his delivery is a little forced. I think. And the fact that he didn't write a second verse, he just repeated the first one. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, the the middle some, something I noticed uh, is the the middle section kind of reminds me of uh, a track on Core. Uh, Sin kind of goes into a similar place where, where it yeah. like drops out into the acoustic like psychedelic section before kicking in with the guitar solo. Yeah, and you got that Dean DeLeo like uh, open tuning acoustic thing that he does yeah. at least once an album. He'll like slide it in there when they're least expecting it. For sure, Kitchenware and Candy Bars was uh, one of my favorites as a kid. Wasn't so much now listening to it, but uh, yeah, there, there's some really great stuff on there that it was great to revisit. Uh, yeah, I I like the uh, the orchestral elements in that yeah. song. I think it really uh, it really that song really kind of ties the album together at the oh, end. It's like sure. the, it's like the cool down song. Yeah. So you know? a couple couple notes that I wrote were uh, one is I wrote a lot of acoustic ballads that were a rip off of this when I was twelve or thirteen. <laughs> uh, it's it's less schmaltzy than their usual ballads and more like kind of melodramatic and, yeah. and like sorrowful yeah uh and uh that that dirty ass guitar solo that kind of breaks up the the melancholia is is pretty great in the middle there well you, you know what it's about right uh I, is this one of the ones where they're complaining about the record company no 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 it was about uh wyland like having like this constant nagging at the back of his mind because uh he and a girlfriend had an abortion at one point in his life Ooh. So that's what the lyrics are about, is just him, like, years later, like, obviously he was probably never in any any shape to have children, no, but uh, no. that was, that was uh, basically what the crux of the song was, was him, like, kind of, like, reflecting on that years later and just kind of wondering what if, like, that sort of thing. Yeah, for sure. Wow. I, I'll have to go back and revisit that. That's pretty, uh, it's pretty intense. Yeah, it is. And, uh, I put that down as one of my favorites, too, because uh, I also had two. Uh, because uh, yeah, it's got a certain emotional weight to it that I think a lot of STP doesn't have. But um, also, it's just it's it's fucking great songwriting. That is yeah, that is about as good as songwriting as you will find in 1994 off of any album. For uh, sure. And I, I, I challenge anyone to uh, to challenge that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, come that, at me, bro. <laughs> yeah, it, it's again with, with Stone Temple Pilots. It's it's not so much the chords they're choosing, but but the voicings of, of those particular chords that really kind of make it sparkle. Yeah. And yeah, they do a lot of that shit uh, on that song, and, and you know a lot of these songs in general. Jim, what about you? Uh, so my favorite is Vaseline. Because a the drums, yeah, the drum part is just awesome, and and that guitar just kicks ass too. Um, and then you know when you when you're kind of coming you're coming out of the chorus there, you get the tribal the tribal bongo thing yeah. going on. Yeah, that's one thing I was noticing is that the overdubs on this album are uh, plentiful. There's a lot of overdubs happening, but none of it seems like in your face. It's all there as like texture. It's all there kind of just in the background. It doesn't feel like an overproduced album, even though they're probably like maxed at track count for every single song. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I don't know. I feel like the Vaseline guitar riff's pretty in your face. Well, I mean, the riff is in your face, but 
the the rhythm guitars that are behind that aren't necessarily because yeah, they're okay. like less dirty guitars or some chorus just kind of adding like a little bit of feel to it that aren't yeah. uh doing the duh, 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 duh. Mm -hmm. they're doing like more like kind of shimmering things that are in the background that are kind of giving it like a little bit more of like a weird acoustic space where it lives right in. right right all right uh your favorite track uh i'm gonna go with big empty me into Stone Temple Pilots uh, via the Crow soundtrack, uh, which is kind of what got me into music to begin with. Um, and it was the sort of thing where like it was my first favorite song by them, so I kind of like started liking other things like Launchfly or, or whatever at different points. Uh, but yeah, I've kind of come full circle. Uh, I appreciate it for what it is. It's, it's such a strange vibe. Like, it's got that big chorus, but it doesn't sound too similar to anything else that was on the radio at that point otherwise. The verses in it sound to me like you're in this weird smoky jazz club, even yeah. though there's nothing jazzy about it at all. It's like just this like dirt. It's yeah. just like this <laughs> dirt band that, you find, that like yeah. you're you're this the family friend that you call like um, Uncle Tony, but he's not actually your uncle. Like he's in this band that plays a couple times a month, and one time your dad dragged you out to see them in a basement somewhere. Like, and it was definitely like an illicit club. Everyone was smoking indoors, and they play like the verses of Big Empty. Like that's all of their repertoire. <laughs> smoking them jazz cigarettes. <laughs> smoking them jazz cigarettes. Uh, no, yeah, I, I wrote pedal or reverb pedal in sight. <laughs> I uh, I wrote that down too. That it, it's really kind of speaks to the the depth of the production between the those verses and choruses. It, it, it's it's pretty pretty stark and, and yeah, really cool. Yeah, and those clean reverby guitars that bridge the two together, I think are uh, that's a perfect segue between what would otherwise be a really awkward two parts of the yeah. Song. They 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 do it. Uh, he does it seamlessly. Yeah, yeah, just like a few drenched chords, and then like you're there and you're not complaining about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm like slowly pushing the the like room mics or whatever yeah I'm exactly sure that's what they were doing make those drums sound like core is, is yeah. basically what they're doing exactly uh, yeah and then i just noted kitchenware and candy bars uh as well just because again just amazing songwriting i think that's probably wyland's best lyrics on the album least favorite song uh uh, Big Empty is my <laughs> 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 only, only because uh, and I wrote that, that it, it's still a great song I've, I've just heard it way too many times yeah. uh, it's the one that I, that I tend to skip over because I've heard it so many times but uh, hearing it in context always <laughs> is, is perfectly fine yeah, yeah. No, no disrespect no, it's, it's cool. You can get the fuck out of my house. <laughs> 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 my, my least favorite song, I kind of went back and forth between uh, Still Remains and uh, Unglued. Uh, Still Remains... I had his least favorite. I think it's kind of a boring, kind of straightforward song, and I always fucking forget that it even exists. So that said, you were definitely fucking like singing along to parts. Oh no, no, I mean, no, sorry. So there, I don't think there are any bad songs on this album. Like I'm just yeah, saying I'm in that. The same boat. Got to pick one. Right? No, I, I, I'm not saying that you're not allowed to have a least favorite. I just think it's funny that your least favorite, you were literally singing. All I was singing all the fucking songs. <laughs> yeah, singing I, all of them. My notes were were for still remains was uh, beautiful song, dumb lyrics. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, on yeah, I had a grand total of uh, three words for notes for still remains. First was underrated, and then the second were underlined, not grunge. <laughs> <laughs> No, yeah, I mean, it's just, I always forget it exists. And then it comes on, I'm like, oh yeah, that that thing. So uh, that's the song I got into, though, as a kid, because uh, it was right after Interstate Love Song, and I had done enough bad dubs on uh, cassette mixes where I'd gotten, like, the first chord of that song, <laughs> trying to get every second of that fade of Interstate Love Song. 
where, um, like, I just get, like, the beginning of it, so finally I just start listening to it, and then I'm, like, begrudgingly telling myself, ah, I guess this isn't that shitty. <laughs> and then, like, one day I was like, yeah, this is a cool song. Uh, uh, yeah, still remains that, that sort of vibe, I think, was done better on the song uh, Glide on, on number four. I don't, do you remember that one? I don't. Um, my knowledge of them posts tiny music is pretty minimal okay yeah that, that was the like one of the the ballads on, on number four but it was like similar chords but i think it was it's a little more interesting the the only ballad i really remember besides sour girl was uh atlanta which oh, right. i think is one of their best but oh for sure um and then i i had mentioned on glute I had mentioned on Glue just because I was listening to this song and going, how the hell was this a single? <laughs> how? Like, I feel like it's something I would have written when I was like 11 years old. Oh, what, about masturbation? <laughs> Moderation being masturbation? Or, or whatever? Yeah, it's, it's a pretty straightforward song. Um, but I, I think that's kind of why it works, too. And it's it's a pretty good choice of them for a single following Core. Um, probably would have been a better lead-off single than uh, most of the others, but, um, you know, didn't hurt their career any. Right. Well, I would say uh, my second album, but I don't think that necessarily counts <laughs> as a Stone Temple Pilot song. We don't know for sure where, where that even came from. It's uh, it's by a Seattle artist named uh, Richard Peterson. Ah. And I, I know very little about it beyond that, but if you look him up online, there's uh, there's some weird devoted followings to him. Uh, there, <laughs> other people are aware of him, probably through STP, but um, yeah, they apparently they were doing like the tour circuit for Core, and they were doing like a radio show gig or something, and um, they were in the studio and just found the tape there in Seattle. And like they were mesmerized by the album art for it, and the local DJ told them all about the guy, and they just started listening to that on the tour bus nonstop. <laughs> that album, that's amazing. Yeah, yeah the the lyrics are, uh, th those are that's him singing, right? I think that is the original recording of uh, good old uh, Richard Peterson. Yeah, uh, but I'm not sure. There's no credits given anywhere, and uh, even like the fairly uh, exhaustive uh, STP website, uh, Below Empty, I think it's called, uh, mm. didn't really have. Too bunch of information on it. Yeah, it, he makes a reference to, to something about Johnny Mathis, which, which I think is kind of interesting. That it's almost like being a uh, like self aware of, of what he's doing. Well, yeah. Uh, apparently, the guy's whole career is uh, him basically picking up the torch that Mathis left behind. Uh, uh, that's what he sees himself as doing. The the actual torch because he's singing torch songs. <laughs> is that a thing? Torch songs. Yeah, yeah, uh, I I can't really give a good explanation of it right now, but it's it's like lounge I'll, it's like lounge music I'll, I'll hold, holding it, holding a torch for for like a past lover. It, it can mean anything from like lounge music to Phil Collins type stuff. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. But of of like proper Stone Temple Pilots canon songs, I would say Pretty Penny was my least favorite this time mm. around. interesting arrangement. I like what everyone in the band is doing. Uh, it's just boring. See, I was thinking about this, I was thinking about Pretty Penny as I was playing, and it's, it's kind of a good segue. Like, uh, it's like an intermission for the album. It's the way I yeah, it. I think it, it could have been like half the length, and it, and it yeah. would have been fine. Uh, it's very, uh, it's kind of like Led Zeppelin-y. That's exactly what I thought. I thought it was pretty specifically trying to be like a Led Zeppelin 3 song. And yeah. I, did, I don't know. Whatever. Well, MVP moment. Ooh, yeah. Okay. Uh, I had a few, or a couple. Uh, <laughs> I had a few. A couple. One. I don't have one. one. I don't <laughs> have. <it. laughs> uh, MVP moment. Interstate love song. That that bass line. Oh, that is 
yeah, so, yeah. for sure. Uh, coupled with those guitar chords, just just super super strong, potent songwriting all around. Yeah, that's that's, that's good shit. Yeah, uh, yeah. If they just wrote that song, that that would have been enough. But oh, uh, Silver Gun Superman, uh, the chaotic drum solo at the end, uh, and then the guy going, "Oh God." <laughs> <laughs> See, that actually, that part actually pisses me off. I think just being a drummer, I'm just like, I just cringe. Yeah. I cringe at it. I think it's like Scott Weiland playing the drums at the end or something. <laughs> uh, Jim, what about you? Uh, so my MVP moment was the, uh, the, the drum fill in Big Empty. He rides the faders up for that fill. Yeah, yeah, really. It, it and it's just slams. Yeah, it really does slam. It really, it, it takes you to, to this whole other plane. Yeah. Uh, especially compared to the, the the verses. Yeah, it just makes it a very powerful song. Uh, what about you? Uh, MVP moment. Um, based on Interstate Love Song as well. Yeah, that was uh, that's pretty pretty baller right there. Uh, but also the other thing I put down was the Mellotron Army Ants. Which I had never heard until this listen. Just oh, I don't even think I noticed it. It's during the breakdown. So when they play the intro again, yeah. there's a Mellotron playing flutes in there. Oh, and yeah. I knew it was in there because I saw it in the credits, but I'd never heard it before. And I don't know if it's just a result of like the vinyl mix having less bass or what the deal is. Uh, but yeah, I heard it tonight. I, yeah, I remember hearing it on the CD. Yeah, that, that was always one of my favorite things. Of the Super Mellotron. subtle. Yeah, it just does the job. Yeah, Army Ants is a great song, actually. I wrote that down as one of my one of my faves when I was a kid. Uh, yeah, really really cool stuff. Nasty Kretz beats. I wrote Snaggy guitar solo, Mellotron. Yeah, that was one like one of my last favorite songs on the album. Like before I kind of moved on to the next thing. Right. Uh, that was like one of the last ones where I was like, yeah, SCP, still you still got me. Mm -hmm. um, and then Tiny Music came out and helped out with that with that workload. Comparison album. I mean, I I had a couple in mind. Uh, one of the ones that I, I could compare it to. It, it's a perfect segue between Core and, and Tiny, you know, where they would go production-wise with Tiny Music, uh, where they were kind of scaling back the reverb, uh, but it still felt kind of arena-y mm -hmm. on Purple. Uh, and and, and Wyland's voice is, is still kind of developing. He, he's, you know, starting to move away from the really throaty or like the really baritone vocals and yeah. kind of going towards that that rasp yeah that he does uh so yeah i mean i always compare it to to core and tiny music another one that i that i uh production wise it kind of reminded me of was uh the band 11 the their self-titled record uh kind of had had similar uh production on on the drums uh I think it, uh, Jack Irons plays drums on that record, but yeah, oh, that interesting. Was, it's always good yeah. when people dust him off and yeah, to good use. Yeah, so yeah, after he uh, left the Chili Peppers, uh, Eleven took them on, took him, and yeah, uh, so yeah, the, the yeah similar kind of drum stuff and, and like uh, very pop inflected, but like you know buzzy guitar stuff. Uh, yeah, that, that was another one that I had thought of. What about you, Jim? Um, you kind of put me on the spot here, but uh, <laughs> now I'm gonna go. Uh, I'm gonna go with Alice in Chains' self-titled album. I think. Uh, uh, yeah. Yes. What? Tripod. Yeah, I can see. Yeah, it. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, because um, I think that album's a pretty, you know, straight rock album, and I think Purple's a pretty straightforward rock album. I think Alice in Chains is a little darker, uh, but sure. I think yeah. there's, there's some some comparison there. Yeah. I, yeah. Also, just like that was. That self-titled was kind of like a like a weird tangent for them, yeah. Uh, with you know the drums were, were right. like a little, 
a little tighter and like guitars were a little buzzier. Like again, the song again, I think. Yeah, it feels more focused, I think, yeah. than a lot of other yeah. stuff. Like Dirt was definitely the sort of thing that you make when you're on drugs. Mm. Um, whereas uh, Tripod was everyone else was carrying the workload while Jerry Kentro or um, Wayne Staley would show up to work like one day a week or something yeah, like that. Yeah, for sure. Cool. Um, I would say, for me, it's it's kind of a, I'm going to go out in left field here, but uh, for me, Purple is a super transitional album, uh, even though it didn't seem it at the time. And I think it really is the halfway point between Core and then where they would end up on Tiny Music and kind of where they'd end up for the rest of their career, um, sort of in that psychedelic sort of realm. Um, so because it is such a perfect halfway point, I think it's very similar, and again, this is a little out of left field, it's similar to Ultra by Depeche Mode. Um, which is another album that is very much a, a direct combination of the two albums on either side of it. Because you had Songs of Faith and Devotion before it, that was like their heavy blues influenced uh, album, where they're actually using like a real drum kit on every song and um, yeah. electric guitar all through the thing and whatever, it had some gospel influence. And then it was followed by Exciter uh, on the other end, which was their super mellow, like finger picked clean electric guitars, like doing ballads and like lullaby type songs. And Ultra was really just, if you took those two and just combined them, uh, Ultra is it. And in hindsight, it's like completely obvious. Like you should have been able to see, like hear what Exciter would have sounded like before it ever even came out, just because the progression is that clear. I don't know. That's, that's kind of what I see here. Liner notes. I mean, they included a sheet. Okay. Yeah, that, that was pretty cool. I've never seen that before. Yeah, I like the sh I like having a sheet. Um, it's it's better than nothing. Because <laughs> kind of like uh, we, were, we were talking about opiate last time, and that had nothing. Like you, you pull out the the record, and that's all you have. You have the front, and the back, and the sleeve. Yeah. Um, it doesn't have to be necessarily have like a gatefold or anything like that. But I, I like having something in there. It's yeah. a step up from uh, I just listened to Pinbacks uh, Summer in Ab Summer in Abaddon uh, over the weekend. And the vinyl for that includes the CD liner notes. So there's a little CD booklet inside it, oh, which okay. is fine, I guess, but it just feels super awkward and yeah. super not thought out and super cheap and, and what have you. So I would say that the custom sheet is kind of a, it's a, it's a step up. It's at least acknowledging the fact that they're releasing on that format. Right. It's, it's very, uh, very indicative of, of 90s liner notes, where it's like the handwritten lyrics with oh, like yeah. studio shots. And I, 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 I love that style. I, it just, yep. it, you know, it might be kind of corny now, but but it's it's it, it's something that like is very nostalgic for me. Something I used to, you know, spend hours doing before we had phones to stare at. I would just like look at liner notes and, and stare at the, at the lyrics or whatever yeah. when I was listening. Yeah, I mean, it was really the only glimpse you got into these people's lives before, you know, the Facebooks came along and, right. and kind of pulled the curtain back a little bit on that. You got anything? <laughs> no, I'm looking at the uh, the artwork notes on Wikipedia right now, and yeah. I'm just realizing I have no idea how to say this word. So it says, the cover for the album features an animated photo of a child riding a, a, a quillin? Q-I-L-I-N. Quillin. Quillen. I have no idea. But Some sort of mythical if I, if I go and I, if I click on the word here, and then this doesn't load. <laughs> Frig. All right, cool. So. <laughs> Real good. Glad, glad we wrapped that up. A Quillen or a Kirin is a mythical hooved chimerical creature known in Chinese and other East Asian I cultures. Love hooves. Said to appear with the imminent it's a, arrival it's a or regular passing of sage or illustrious <laughs> ruler. Uh, what's your favorite ungulate? Wait, uh, what's an ungulate again? It, that, it's a hooved mammal. Ooh, oh yes, yes. Uh, yeah, I, I, I like learned that those. from a Far Side cartoon. <laughs> <laughs> There's a dude standing in an alley with like a uh, he had a trench coat on and he had one side of it open and standing behind him like a bunch of giraffes I'm, and shit down the alley. I'm gonna go with the Minotaur. <laughs> All right, that's doesn't have hooves, does it? Yeah, it does. I thought it had man stuff. It had a it has hoof legs and then man to oh no wait, that's the opposite yeah it's it's mm -hmm. man man body head of the head of a bull. god damn oh my god can you imagine how terrifying that minotaur would be where it has like the body of a <laughs> bull but like a dude's head <laughs> <laughs> well it's actually dr moreau shit <laughs> it could be like a satyr where, where they have the feet are 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 hooved but then their their arms are are man arms I'm I'm fine with that, just as long as it doesn't have an anthropomorphic face. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't want any pig people. You know, pig uh, people. Pig Minotaur. People 
I think it was, it was Minotaur 3 was one of my first screen names on AOL back when I was in, like, fifth grade. So when you said Minotaur 3, I originally thought that you were going to be talking about an album yeah. by a band named Minotaur. <laughs> I thought you were going to be talking so, about a yeah. game, a video So game. Minotaur 3, they, they really, you know, they, they take it in this Minotaur crazy direction. Minotaur from New York. <laughs> Oh my god, how good would that be? Because they could have a tour called Minotaur. <laughs> <laughs> We're just playing the Northeast this time, guys. Minotaur. Join us for Minotaur. <laughs> See you in Portland. Oh, fantastic. All right, well, that is uh, 1994's Purple. Uh, it's a great fucking album. Uh, just unironically fucking still love that album. Uh, definitely deserves a listen if you've not uh, done so. Yeah, like I was mentioning earlier, that was one of my go-tos when I was mowing the neighborhood lawns as a, as a wee lad. Yeah, this is, for, for me, like one of one of the first albums I got, got into as, as a young songwriter when I was like in sixth grade, so it's pretty, uh, pretty important to me as well. Yeah, it was probably the first full length that I really started diving into and kind of dissecting, and it's definitely one of... Uh, one of two albums, actually, that made me want to start making music myself. So, yeah, definitely pretty important for me, too. Yeah, there, there was something about, uh, you know, I remember, like, I, I think I, I was big into Metallica before that, and then getting into Stone Temple Pilots, the songs were, like, shorter and, like, prettier and, and, and more, like, more focused, and, and, and that way, like, songwriting seemed a little more uh, accessible to me, and I think that was definitely what kick-started me. Yeah, it wasn't just some it. angry dude from the Bay Area. Yeah, doing there, a lot of yes. <laughs> yeah, 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 you know, it was there was you know other you know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, exactly. <laughs> He's now a scat singer. All right, uh, cool. So we uh, are we done? <laughs> yeah, I think we're good here. All right, cool. We can edit that part out. Thanks for listening, everyone. This has been Old Man Yellow Cloud. I am Christopher. I'm Jim. And I'm Patrick. And we'll see you now. <laughs> <laughs>